and welcome everyone. I know people are still joining, but um, you're very welcome this afternoon to this first uh, online Edinburgh Mental Health Conference um, and really an introduction to what we hope will become a new interdisciplinary cross university network for mental health research at the university. Um, my name is Danny Smith. I'm a professor of psychiatry and head of the Division of Psychiatry um, and I'm also a consultant psychiatrist and along with Sumit Jain and many others we've been for the last few months uh, planning this launch uh, of Edinburgh Mental Health and we hope really this afternoon just to showcase some of the diversity and depths and breadth of mental health research activity that's happening across the university as a springboard to collaboration and future uh, future network development. So next slide Amy. So this is a, a great time to be involved in mental health research uh, for many different reasons. Obviously, it's an incredibly important part of health research and medicine, uh, but also it's a major priority for all the funders currently. Uh, that includes MRC, ESRC, etc., but also the Wellcome Trust um, and NIHR. And we know that it's a priority area for governments in the UK and beyond. Uh, and as many of you will be aware that uh, the pandemic and the last couple of years have really highlighted uh, the importance of mental health, but also new opportunities for developing research in, in other areas. Um, I think just to highlight that uh, over the last couple of years, it's become very clear that the priorities of funders has uh, developed uh, recently. So that it's very much about uh, looking for clear evidence of interdisciplinary working. Uh, they're very keen, of course, on team science as well as open science. Uh, and obviously it's critical that all the research that we do is around co-production with patients and the public. Uh, and then one thing that we would be very keen on in Edinburgh Mental Health is to develop capacity, particularly of younger researchers, to try and um, uh, prepare for the future where we have a workforce capable of doing this exciting interdisciplinary type work. Uh, so we're very keen to promote early career researcher activity as part of as part of this new network. Next slide, Amy. So why Edinburgh? So, well, as many of you will know, there are, there are enormous strengths in terms of um, research in mental health in Edinburgh. Um, so the most obvious strengths are around basic and clinical neuroscience, uh, psychiatry, genomics, brain imaging, clinical psychology, uh, but also public and population health and social sciences and global mental health. So that's that's really just to name a few of the most obvious strengths, I think. Um, but additionally, of course, um, there's a huge network of excellent work going on in all sorts of departments and um, colleges and schools. Um, I won't name all of these. Um, some of you will see your special area of interest highlighted, but you know, this ranges from artificial intelligence through geography, health informatics, uh, stigma, poverty, violence, counselling studies, um, cultural heritage, etc. And I think it'd be great this afternoon, uh, and, and indeed the, the speakers that we've chosen for this afternoon, really are just to give a flavour of this depth and breadth of expertise, uh, just to highlight that as a kickoff. Next slide. So what do we want to achieve over the next, um, well, the next couple of years, really? Uh, first, top of our list really is to consult widely with the community uh, in Edinburgh, but also include people with mental illness, lived experience, patients, families, clinicians, third sector organisations, etc. Um, so that's really important for the development and sustainability of network activities. But we also want to map exactly what's going on across the university so that people know where to go to develop collaborations and and also so that we can be agile in terms of responding quickly and comprehensively to funding calls as and when they arise. Uh, so we really need to get a clear idea of that and indeed Sumit and others are, are going to be leading on that kind of mapping exercise soon. Uh, Amy, uh, who is the network coordinator, Amy Ferguson, will be leading the website and social media activities and everyone's very welcome to contribute to that. And of course, over the next first, the first few months, we really want to sort out things like management and governance structures, steering group and external advisory boards. And really, this is an open invitation today for people who are interested in being an active member of the network to get in touch with us uh, and to take on some of these roles and responsibilities, if that's something that you'd be keen to do. Um, next slide, Amy. Uh, 
So I wanted to highlight that today was going to be an in-person uh, meeting, but COVID intervened for various in various ways. So, uh, but please mark in your diaries the 28th of March, when we will be hopefully having a, a pretty uh, major conference, I think, um, really to, to launch the network, I think, and to facilitate networking and to start to think carefully about collaborations and areas of um, uh, sort of uh, priority activity. So that will happen in Edinburgh Monday, the 20th of March. So hopefully uh, most of you here today and others will be able to attend. And then over the next wee while, we're going to develop our PPIE work as well as our knowledge exchange work. And um, we've got an eye on sustainability, of course, and how to make the network work for everyone. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're very keen to support early career researchers uh, over the next few years. Next slide, Amy. So this is a very, this is a summary really over the next three years of activity. Uh, just to highlight a couple of things here. The first is of course that every March we hope to have a, an annual conference and we hope that the, the strength of the conference will uh, get, get stronger and stronger every year and that it'll be something that the whole university is able to participate in. Um, and then but by the end of year one, we hope to have a few things established, including the website, the social media, the mental health research mapping exercise, our leadership team, advisory board all established, and maybe some core research themes. So a lot to do in year one, uh, but as year two and three progress, we will have regular seminars and training and network events for early career researchers. And we're very keen to hear from people about what exactly they would like those training opportunities to look like. Um, but of course, we've also got an eye on how are we going to develop uh, really ambitious, competitive, collaborative grants? So we anticipate in year two, we'll be looking at supporting people with early career researcher fellowship applications, with project grant applications. And then maybe as we move into years two and three, we'll be in a position hopefully to think about program grants as well as even perhaps research center applications. But that obviously is going to take a lot of work and a lot of collaboration over the next two years. And running all through this, uh, of course, we want to develop our public engagement and our knowledge exchange activities. So that's really a very brief outline of what we hope to achieve. And as I said already, anyone who's very keen to get actively involved in this, then we're very keen to hear from you. So I'm going to stop there. Oh, I think the next slide is really just to show you what's coming up. So in a moment, I'll introduce Craig Morgan, uh, who's going to speak for about half an hour. And then after that, we've got six flash talks. Uh, from lots of different people across the university. We'll have a break, we'll come back for more flash talks and then uh, Dr. Sumit Jain will sum up with next steps for the network. Um, so hopefully you can stay with us for the whole afternoon, but if you can't, no problem. Uh, we'll be in touch with everyone after the event to get some feedback and to get your thoughts about what we might do in person on the 28th of March. So I'll stop there um, and I'll introduce our first speaker. Uh, so it's a great pleasure. I don't know, Amy, are you going to, can Craig share his slides just now? So yeah, it's my, should be able to. Okay, great. So welcome Professor Craig Morgan. C Craig is Professor of Social Epidemiology and Head of the Health Service and Population Research Department at the Institute of Psychiatry in King's College London. Uh, Craig is also co-director of the ESRC Centre for Society and Mental Health at King's. Uh, he has many research interests, I think it's fair to say, but that include uh, social and cultural influences on psychosis, adolescent mental health, and developing methods for the analysis of causal pathways, interactions and trajectories of disorder. So Craig, you're very welcome. Um, thanks for speaking to us today. Really looking forward to your talk. Um, I'll pass over to you. Thanks, Craig. Thanks very much, Danny. Um, it, it is a real pleasure. I'm just sorry. Ah, I was just having a minor sort of panic that I couldn't share my screen. Can you all see that now? Yeah, looks good. Ah, perfect. Okay. Lovely. Thanks very much. It, it is a real pleasure, um, and and very grateful for the for the invitation. I'd I'd very much hoped that it, I would be in Edinburgh with you all. Um, but of course, as you, as you mentioned, Danny, this has just not been possible, unfortunately. Um, but but it, it's nonetheless a, a pleasure to be able to, to contribute. I guess in, in thinking and, and considering what to, to talk about, I was trying to think about what might be of interest and what might be um, 
something that, that would be a kind of substantive topic and something that might give you a little bit of something new, possibly something a little challenging. Um, but also what, what would be of some interest and value in relation to developing an interdisciplinary network. So I, so I guess I hope that what I planned to talk about will go um, some way towards doing both of those. I, I guess, as you mentioned, Danny, I, I do have a fair range of interests. And so um, that there are a number of choices, but, but I will talk predominantly about psychoses um, in this. Um, and a, a lot of the, the work that I've been involved in really stemmed from um, this project, from the ESOP study, which some of you may be aware of. Um, and I was actually very lucky to do my PhD as part of this study, um, led by, at, at the outset, by um, Professors Peter Jones, Glyn Harrison, Julian Leff, and uh, Robin Murray. And just very briefly, the, the, the aim of, of the ESOP study, which was established in the late 1990s, was to investigate the incidence of and the risks for psychoses, particularly in migrant and minority ethnic populations in the UK. And it ultimately comprised around about 500 individuals with a first episode psychoses and about 400 uh, population-based controls, all with fairly extensive data on a whole range of risks. Um, but, but what's particularly interesting about, and, and for this talk, um, is the story of how ESOP came to be a story that I've heard from Robin um, and, and also from Julian. Um, and it's relevant to, I think, what you were saying, Danny, about the, um, the interest that funders have now in interdisciplinary work. Um, because back in, in the late 1990s, I guess, um, Robin Murray, for example, um, was primarily interested in biological and genetic aspects of psychosis. Uh, Julian Leff was primarily interested in social dimensions of psychosis. Many of you will be familiar with his work on, for example, expressed emotion. Um, and the two of them had not worked together, despite being in the same institution for, for many years. And around about this time, around about the late 1990s, both um, each separately put in applications to the MRC, to Medical Research Council, Julian to study ethnicity and social risks, and Robin to study biological risks. And it was actually the MRC um, that suggested they combine and work together. So they invited them, uh, they rejected their initial applications, invited them to submit a new combined application and this was how this was how essentially ESOP was born so it really took the MRC to insist on the potential value of interdisciplinary research of research that spanned and drew from several perspectives and and, and approaches and of course others have got to the same conclusion as uh, and as you mentioned and now interdisciplinary working is is widely accepted as being essential and indeed I think is essential for all uh, mental health research and I think the the outputs and so on from ESOP um, I, I underscores this and, and, I, and I talk about it and introduce it because much of the work that I've been involved in and, and worked on and much of the kind of work that I've done since it elaborates on and extends the work that has been done in ESOP. Um, so in this talk what I want to do is I want to focus on psychosis as I mentioned um, and I want to do uh, three things. Um, first I want to talk about three trends in psychosis research over the past 20 years that I think have uh, shifted our understandings of psychosis uh, substantially. Um, I'm going to focus then specifically on talking about evidence that social risks are relevant for psychosis um, and pick up particularly on the question of the relationship between childhood adversities and psychosis and, and we'll spend the, the, the bulk of uh, time on this trying to sketch based on, on some recent data perhaps provocative idea that among multiple, no doubt, overlapping pathways to psychosis, there may be for some a predominantly what we call a socio-developmental pathway, one in which exposure to threats, hostility, violence, and so on is especially important. And then finally, to, to finish, I want to kind of expand out from that and just give some very brief examples of how the work um, beginning in ESOP, including the work um, that, that I will talk about in relation to child adversities, how that's developed by our international interdisciplinary collaborations into other programs of work. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, as, as you mentioned, Danny, to our newly established Centre for Society and Mental Health. Um, and so hopefully hopefully this will be, be of, of, of some interest and some relevance to, to what you're talking about today and what you're uh, beginning to develop. So to begin with some with trends, um, I guess first in, in the past 20 years, and, and some of this will be very familiar to you all. Um, a large body of evidence has accumulated that the incidence, the occurrence of psychosis, in fact, varies quite markedly by place and by social group, which is in fact, in, in contrast to what was often inferred from international studies of psychosis that were conducted in the late 19, uh, in, in the 1970s and the 1980s by the World Health Organization. 
from which the conclusion was drawn that there is a relatively uniform incidence of psychoses worldwide. But in the past 20 years, I think there's a lot of evidence accumulated that suggests that's highly unlikely to be the case. And ESOP, I mean, it's focused on trying to understand something about variations by ethnic group in the UK, contributed this to a certain degree. And I, what you see here are findings um, with some of the lead findings from the ESOP study showing that the incidence was much higher in Black Caribbean and Black African populations compared with the white British uh, population. There, there were other findings to emerge from ESOP which were relevant to, to this, these types of questions. Many of you will be familiar with repeated findings that the incidence appears to be higher in urban areas compared with rural areas. And what we in addition found in ESOP, and this is work that was led by James Kirk Bride, who's a geographer, um, was that it wasn't just a variation by crudely urban and rural, but also within urban areas, there was marked variation according to different markers of for example, measures of social fragmentation and, and so on. And all that this slide here shows is just the variation represented by the different colored, uh, the different shadings essentially. And I guess you don't really need to know much other than that there's variation here. And it's just to kind of illustrate this point that I think there is clear variation. And of course, variation is potentially important because it offers clues to etiology, it offers us some clues as to what causes psychosis. If we can understand what's underpinning and what's driving these variations, then we can understand something about the contributing, uh, uh, the contributing influences of possibly environmental factors. Secondly, in, in the past and, and, and the same period, the past 20 years or so, our concepts and views about the nature of psychosis have, I think, changed um, in, in some ways subtly, but in other ways quite fundamentally. I think um, that what we take to be the core features of psychosis, or at least what we've increasingly focused on, has moved, has shifted from a focus on negative or disorganized symptoms and cognitive deficits to what we might call uh, positive symptoms, to delusions, hallucinations, disturbances of thought and so on. And, and with this, our, our perspective has, has broadened from a narrowly defined concept of schizophrenia to a broader range of psychosis that encompass effective, non-effective disorders and that now it extends to low level psychotic or unusual anomalous experiences such as fleeting hallucinations, suspiciousness, magical thinking and so on. And there's actually a lot of research on this. And, and again, I, I'm guessing that many of you, if not all of you are familiar with this. Um, and it's a line of research that's contributed to renewed interest in the in continuum models of psychosis in which psychotic disorder essentially lies at the extreme end of the continuum of psychotic experiences that vary in, in frequency, intensity, severity. Um, and in fact, a lot of the research on social risks has actually been in relation to these low level psychotic experiences rather than psychotic disorder. But what's particularly interesting um, about these types of experiences is that there, there appear to be similar associations as with psychotic disorder. So for example, this here is just showing, showing data from a study um, that we did in the same area as ESOP, a community-based study, where we um, collected information about these psychotic experiences in a, in a population sample. And what we found, and, and this has been replicated in other studies, is that you see also, um, as with the incidence of psychotic disorder, you find, we find that the uh, prevalence of these types of experiences are more common in some ethnic groups um, compared with others. Um, and then finally, in terms of trends, these sorts of variations and the emergence of evidence relating to variations has really um, stimulated interest in the potential role of socio-environmental risks um, and, and their contribution to the onset of psychoses. And such that I think our understanding on the back of this of the etiology of psychoses has um, broadened from a focus on genes, biology and so on to encompass a wider range of, uh, of putative risks. Um, and the idea being that various combinations of these risks push individuals along developmental pathways uh, to psychoses. And, and of interest, it might be that particular clusters of causes may then underpin different clusters of symptoms and subsequent trajectories um, and might contribute and, and explain some of the heterogeneity that we see in the manifestations and the subsequent course and outcome of psychoses. And all, all that's listed here on this slide is just um, some examples of the types of social risks for which there is some um, evidence um, or, or a reasonable amount of evidence. Um, and, it's, and it's these kind of social risks that I want to 
talk about and focus on in, in the remainder of the bulk of, of what I want to talk about. But as I mentioned, I want to do that specifically in relation to childhood adversities. Um, it's possibly um, the most researched, um, broadly speaking, social risk. Um, and it's particularly informative. It's informative for um, understanding in general how the, the, the kind of uh, experiences of adverse social conditions and adverse social experiences might impact on uh, psychosis, but also of the limitations and the challenges and so on in relation to trying to link the social with the onset of, uh, of psychosis. So just to begin, I guess on the face of it, the evidence um, is fairly consistent and fairly clear. And some of it is summarized here in quite an early review, which essentially shows that for various forms of adversity, um, there is about a two to fourfold, in, uh, two to three to fourfold increased likelihood of psychosis. Um, this is a, a, an early review, but there has been a lot of subsequent evidence and it all points in this broad direction that a, a whole range of childhood adversities are associated with an increased uh, risk or odds of psychosis. But there are some issues with this and some limitations. Um, and I want to highlight a few of these. First, most of the research has tended to analyze adversity separately as kind of dichotomous variables, grouping individuals into exposed and unexposed, for example, um, being separated from a parent or not, being abused or not, being bullied or not, at any time during childhood without any consideration of timing, duration, frequency, or severity of exposure. These dimensions are actually likely to be really quite profoundly important. Adversities tend to cluster, and the meaning and impact of experiences that matters. There are other issues. Childhood adversities are associated with a whole range of negative mental health and other outcomes. And this raises the obvious question of why do some develop psychosis, some depression and so on. Also, many, uh, many people, many young people are exposed to these types of adversities, but only a minority develop psychotic experiences and fewer still develop a psychotic disorder. And this raises then further questions about what moderates the impact of social conditions and experiences on risks and what pathways and mechanisms through which, uh, through what pathways and mechanisms might these uh, risks operate. And in beginning to expand and extend our work on understanding these types of social risks, I think this is another area where interdisciplinary work is essential, social science approaches to conceptualizing social experience, to measuring and capturing social experience, I think is, is essential here. And so what I want to do is to present some findings from a recent study that we completed, um, in which was set up specifically to try and address some of these issues. Um, and, and that was at its heart multidisciplinary, um, drawing on a, a lot of social science um, approaches and so on. And the aim of this study was to gather more detailed information on exposure to these adversities um, with consideration of timing, duration, severity and so on, on how exposure is clustered and whether there was any specificity or type or severity of experience. So just very quickly, this was a study of um, first episode uh, psychosis sample around about 300 individuals with first episode psychosis, uh, 300 uh, comparison uh, population-based controls. And we were interested in looking at really three sets of questions. So do the associations um, hold when we look at a, a, a predominantly um, clinical sample? Um, are the effects of, uh, of adversities cumulative? cumulative? Um, does severity matter? And is there any evidence of combined effects or interactions with other potential putative risks, both genetic um, and, and other environmental risks. And I just want to spend a little bit of time presenting um, some findings in relation to each of these. So to begin, this is just overall, this is the presence or absence of um, five types of early child adversity, um, uh, discord between parents in the household, experiences of bullying, and then three forms of abuse, psychological abuse, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. And what I hope is fairly clear from this is that the, um, the, the findings very much mirror those that have come from systematic reviews, that there's about a two to fourfold increased odds of psychosis amongst those who report these types of experiences in childhood. So, so far, I think this is, this is precisely um, what would be expected from the literature. Um, but we wanted to and, 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 and look at this kind of uh, further. And as you do this, I think interesting things begin to emerge. So for example, 
um, we, in, in collecting information about childhood adversity, we spent um, a, a considerable amount of time using semi-structured interviews to elicit detailed accounts of people's experiences. And from that, using standard um, cut points, we were able to distinguish the severity of the exposure. And what's going to be shown here is distinguishing between moderate and marked severity, or in relation to household discord, uh, distinguishing further uh, those who reported um, witnessing uh, domestic violence um, in, in the household while growing up. And what we found essentially is that um, the strongest effects were for the most severe levels of exposure. And in fact, for something like household discord, for example, the, the effect was owned, there was only a, an effect evident um, when there was domestic violence or when domestic violence was witnessed in the household. For bullying, and just to kind of give some sense of the distinction between moderate and, and marked, um, for bullying, um, a, a rating of a marked, a marked severity of bullying essentially in, involves physical bullying, essentially being physically threatened or physically assaulted um, in, in the context of, of prolonged experiences of bullying. And of course, the various forms of abuse and so on inevitably involve elements of hostility, violence, and, and threat as part of them. So I think from here, suggestive, um, interesting evidence that um, the more severe the exposure, the greater the risk. And this is especially interesting because it also brings to mind um, this study by uh, Louise Arsenault and colleagues, um, a, a different study, different design. This was a study um, of uh, 2000 twin pairs followed uh, from ages eight to 12 with information collected from parents and from uh, the, where possible from the young people. Um, and they collected information about the, these kind of low level uh, psychotic experiences at age 12. They'd also collected information about experiences of childhood trauma, as you can see here, accidents, bullying, maltreatment at age eight. And they looked at what the risk of psychotic experience was according to each of these different exposures. And what's especially interesting is that in relation to accidents, they found no evidence that there was an increased risk. Some evidence that there was an increased risk for bullying and for maltreatment and um, a, a greater risk still for those who were exposed to both. And the interesting thing about this and the conclusion that uh, Louise Arsenal and colleagues drew from this was that what might be specifically important in the onset or the development of psychotic experiences and ultimately of psychotic disorders is exposure to experiences that involve an intention to harm. Um, it's, it's interesting in this context, um, and I think we, we forget about this to a certain degree, but thinking back to Julian Leff's work on expressed emotion, one of the key elements, one of the uh, three key elements in, in expressed emotion that seemed to contribute to an increased likelihood of, of relapse um, was hostility um, on, on the part of parents towards the individual experiencing uh, psychosis. Extending this then a little bit further and mirroring the findings um, that, uh, in, in Louise Arsenault's study, if you then begin to um, create some kind of index, a, a sort of crude index, counting up the number of experiences of adversities that people have been exposed to. Again, it, and this is, this is seen from our data and lots of other data that kind of suggest this, the, the greatest odds of psychosis are amongst those with the greatest number of, of reported experiences. In, in these data, we don't quite see a neat linear trend. There's a possibility here that it might be the exposure to a large number, um, which creates a kind of threshold effect. But I think what's most important to note is that the more adversities there are, the greater the, the odds of psychosis. So as you begin to kind of elaborate on these associations, then you begin to see some interesting uh, patterns, which might begin to explain why in some people um, psychosis. To extend this a little bit further, we, we also then took a further step of actually trying to look at how um, or the impacts of exposure to experiences of uh, multiple cluster of, uh, clusters of adversity. And the way that we sought to do this was using all the indicators of adversity that we collected information on was to conduct, conduct some uh, latent class analyses. Just very briefly, and again, I'm sure that many of you, if not all of you will be aware of this, latent class analyses simply um, seeks to identify groups of individuals who are characterized by similar levels of probability of exposure in this instance to this range of, uh, of adversities. And we found um, three groups, one group characterized by a relatively low probability 
of exposure to each of these adversities. A, a second group with a relatively high probability of exposure to each of these forms of adversity. And finally, a group um, that had, um, on the one hand, relatively high probabilities of exposure to the experiences here on the left-hand side um, of, the, of the chart, and a relatively low probability of exposure to some of the more severe forms of adversity on the uh, right-hand side of the chart. And then we were able to classify individuals into these categories and then compare cases and controls um, and ask the question, is there any evidence that there's a greater likelihood that cases will fall into the uh, categories with the highest um, probabilities of exposure? And that is indeed what we found, that those in this highest category here are five times more likely to be cases compared with controls. So something again that begins to hint that there may be something here to do with the um, the cumulative clustered effect of exposure to multiple experiences, uh, experiences in particular that involve threat, um, hostility, and, and violence. And, and this also then brings to mind work by George Brown and Terrell Harris. And just to explain a little bit about this, and some of you, again, may be aware of this, of this work. In, in the 1970s, 1980s, George Brown and Terrell Harris did a lot of work on life events and uh, depression. And they found in particular that depression was associated with events that involved elements of humiliation, entrapment and loss. And so they speculated from that whether there was indeed some specificity for the type of experience and the type of subsequent mental health problem that followed. And, and in that they speculated that the types of experiences that might be particularly relevant for psychosis are those that what they call intrusive events, essentially events that involve threat. Um, and a direct threat to the integrity of, of individuals. And as part of this same study, we used the George Brown, Terrell Harris uh, life events and difficulty schedule. We were able to classify events according to whether they were intrusive or not. And again, what we found was that the, those who reported intrusive events were substantially more likely to be cases that uh, compare with controls. So some additional evidence here that um, experience, particularly experiences involving these elements of threat, hostility, and so on, may be particularly important in relation to uh, psychosis. And just very quickly, um, this brings to mind and, and takes us back to the literature, the question about migration, ethnic minority groups, and uh, psychosis. And this should, just shows findings from two studies. Uh, one that's rating the um, level of discrimination experienced by different populations in Holland, um, and one which is separated out and characterized people's exposures to different forms of racial harassment. And the key here is that the more uh, discriminated against populations are, groups are, the higher their incidence, um, and the highest, the strongest association rather um, with psychosis for forms of racial harassment was for physical um, harassment. So harassment that involves physical uh, violence. Um, and then finally, just on this, and then I'm gonna Kind of say a little bit about what I think some of this means and then come back to uh, collaborations. And we were also able then to combine and, and look at the combined effect of childhood adversities and adult life events. And to try and do this very quickly, um, essentially you've got four groups, those who are not exposed to either, those exposed to adversities in childhood, those exposed to life events, and those exposed to both. And if um, the impact of adversities and life events um, were essentially independent and didn't interact. What you would expect amongst those who have and experience both is that the, uh, the effect would essentially be the sum of these two individual effects. But I hope what you can see in, instead is that there is actually a substantial amount which is over and above the sum of these two individual effects, which suggests there's some combined synergistic effect of being exposed um, to multiple difficult, challenging experiences um, over the life course. So, and that's a very, uh, very quick run through some of the, uh, some of this data and some of this thinking. So to try and very quickly pull this together um, and the conclusions that we're trying to possibly um, uh, provocatively uh, draw from this is it, it, maybe there is a distinct, um, what we're calling socio-developmental pathway to psychosis in which prolonged exposure to threat at critical points during the life course, possibly against the background of poverty and isolation, has lasting effects on, for example, cognitive schema, on affected processes, related biological systems that predispose some to developing psychosis. And that, that vulnerability 
may be realised in the event of exposure to further risks in, uh, in adulthood. And of course, there are several um, interrelated candidate psychological, biological mechanisms that might link social risks and, and psychotic disorder. And just to, to very quickly uh, give an example, it may be, for, for instance, that experiences of threat, hostility and violence might increase risk for psychosis, particularly paranoid delusions through the development of cognitive biases and effective processes such that prolonged exposure to threat uh, might contribute to a heightened tendency to ruminate, to perceive directed interpersonal threat in everyday interactions, fostering beliefs, ultimately of persecution, that in the presence of additional risks develop and crystallize into the kind of negative conspiratorial uh, beliefs about the uh, malicious intentions of others. So that's the kind of, that, that's where we're at in terms of thinking at, around this, possibly provocatively so. Um, in, in, in coming to that, I wanted to now kind of um, just finish by pointing to several additional avenues that have emerged from and developed from this work, essentially sort of um, highlighting the, the potential value of, of uh, interdisciplinary networks and international collaborations and so on that have come from this. So firstly, um, the, the work of, that we uh, uh, completed in, in ESOP has extended in, in, in several ways, but in, in particular into um, a, a number of international uh, multinational uh, studies, one example of which is this EU GI study. Um, this is a study, a consortium bringing together a wide range of disciplines, psychiatry, psychology, epidemiology, geography, social science, and so on, in a really ambitious project to examine gene environment interaction in psychoses. Um, it involves six countries, 16 sites. And, and this is beginning to shed uh, additional light on our understandings of the ways in which psychoses vary um, across the board. We, we replicate that there is a higher uh, incidence among migrant and minority populations. But, but interestingly, the urban effect that's been reported in Northern Europe doesn't necessarily appear, at least in these data, to extend to, to Southern, Southern Europe. And there's emerging evidence from, uh, from the global south that there isn't quite the clear urban rural variation that we see in other studies. So by extending outwards and collaborating internationally, we can shed new light on our understanding of patterns of psychosis and ultimately of, um, of, of understanding the, um, the onset and, and the occurrence of disorders. This, this just very quickly also shows data from that study in relation to symptom dimensions, and it shows wide variation by ethnic group. And what's particularly interesting here is that the, uh, the Black and, and North African groups, which tend to have higher uh, rates of psychosis, possibly as a consequence of exposure to more frequent exposure to some of the social risks that I've talked about also appear to have more positive symptoms, uh, uh, hallucinations, delusions, and so on compared with other, with other populations. So we can begin to kind of unravel, um, or at least try to unravel some of these uh, potential hypotheses through this type, kind of collaborative work. We've also continued with, with ESOP, we've extended to, to follow up at 10 years, um, the, the, the individuals included in ESOP just to give an illustrative example from, uh, from that work, the, it, it appears that there's also variation, not just in the occurrence of psychosis, but also in the course and outcome of psychosis by uh, ethnic group. And it seems that those groups who have the highest rates also appear to have the worst outcomes. This is just illustrated comparing those with an episodic versus a continuous course and the Black African, Black Caribbean groups, Black Caribbean in particular, um, appear to have, uh, or more likely to have a continuous uh, course of illness. And just one final uh, example, we've mo most recently extended this internationally in, in this study in the Global South, where we've um, set up uh, studies in uh, India, Nigeria, and Trinidad, and this links to, to some of the work that I, I think you'll hear about today, um, that, that Stephen Laurie and, and, and colleagues here that in Edinburgh are leading in, in Malawi, uh, trying to understand whether the kind of things that we observe in, in high income countries in the global north, whether they extend to uh, the global south. And of course, in looking at um, the occurrence, uh, the onset, the outcomes, the risks and so on for psychosis in these settings, they, they can then shed light more globally on our understanding of psychosis. And just a very quick taste for this. This just shows you some of the findings in relation to the incidents that we're getting from these studies. Um, and hopefully what you can see very quickly is that there is quite wide variation, and in particular that rates are highest in Trinidad, uh, 
Um, I can say, I, I don't know if there'll be time for questions, but I could say a little bit about what and, and the reasons why that might be the high levels of cannabis use and, uh, and, and of trauma and violence, uh, community violence in Trinidad. Trinidad is a very interesting place just off the coast of South Africa, uh, South America, um, and, and, and a very um, a, a very commonly used route for the transit, uh, transit of drugs from South America um, via Trinidad to, to the US. Um, and, and of course, all that comes with that. And, and I kind of flag these just because um, it, it further just highlights the value of international interdisciplinary collaborations, the absolute necessity um, in, in, in answering the kinds of questions that we currently have um, of, of these sorts of collaborations. And then just to, to finish um, this, the work that, that I've been involved in and the collaborations that have developed as part of this, I formed uh, to a certain degree the basis for establishing this new ESRC funded Centre for Society and Mental Health at King's, which, and I'm not going to go into detail on it because I think um, I can't see a time, so I'm hoping that I'm not too far over time. Um, but it, but it's, a, it's a collaboration with a, a large number of different disciplines, in particular uh, social scientists, but again, bringing in uh, one of the things that Danny mentioned right at the beginning, uh, strong partnerships with people with experience and wider uh, state stakeholder networks and um, and with a, with a focus very much on trying to understand social tran transformations and their impacts on on mental health. So so I hope that this gives a kind of flavour um, of some of the interdisciplinary programmes of work that I've been involved in and the potential value of these, but also something of substantial interest in talking about social risks in relation to psychosis and possibly a, a little bit provocative and challenging in suggesting that there's um, for some people, a, a predominantly uh, socio-developmental pathway to psychosis. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Craig. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, lots of thought-provoking uh, information there. And I'm, I'm happy to admit that's the first time I've seen the socio-developmental pathways sort of articulated uh, so clearly. So that was great to see. We could have a couple of questions if people are keen. They could put one into the, the Q&A. Um, someone has already, but I think you've answered that question in your slides, I would have thought. I don't know if you can see that. Um, is the higher risk for black people only present in populations where black people are minority, or does it occur where the majority of people are black? So it's obviously very nuanced, isn't it, that, that sort of um, question? I think it is nuanced, and um, the, the problem is it's hard to draw, draw generalisations because we, we only have data in, in a small number of contexts. Um, the what, what wasn't shown on the slide is that the, the rates among Asian populations in the UK are not really elevated or there's not strong evidence that they're elevated to at least uh, to the same extent. Um, I don't know to what extent we can really compare the data from Trinidad across um, the, the, Trinid the African Trinidadian population is predominantly urban pop population um, and so that may be, be contributing to that. So I think that the key here is that it's, it's by exploring and, and broadening these types of comparisons that we do begin to kind of shed light on these, but universal um, kind of findings and explanations, I think are unlikely. Yeah. So another take home from me, Craig, just to highlight it was around, you know, the advantage in sort of the CAPSI study and other studies about really detailed data collection methods, very, very, you know, comb combining quantitative and qualitative data collection and, and lots of different perspectives and expertise for something as complex as psychosis, you know, it's inevitable that we need some really um, sort of comprehensive ways to collect data at different stages, don't we? So that's something that no nobody can do on their own and needs a lot of expertise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and it, 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 it throws up its own challenges. Like one, of, one of the sort of paradoxes of getting more detailed information is that you can then only do it with a smaller number of people. But to be able to kind of elaborate these associations, you need large samples. And so we have a real challenge around that, which I think is, is where also then, and I guess this is extended to the EU GI study, that's where you need big collaborations and consortia where you can generate large amounts of uh, big, big samples, but also have the same depth of, of information. Great. So Craig, thanks. Thanks everyone who's putting Q and A's. Maybe I could ask Craig to answer to type in answers to the q a if that would be okay we're, we're just we're keen to move on to hear all of these flash talks but craig thanks very much again a fantastic talk and great to have you on, on board today um so i'm going to try and hand over to amy now who's 
um, courageously uh, offered to chair these five-minute flash talks. So over to you, Amy. Thanks.